I've been going through this document here. Yeah. Now, if you look at that document, this document is called The Imperial Treaties and the Origins of British Colonial Rule in Southern Nigeria, 1860-1890. Uh, it's written by, written by Tu Inyang, a PhD, a doctor, a doctor of Department of History, International Studies, and um, Manasi Bassi, PhD, Doctor, Department of Political Science and Public Administration, and then University of Nigeria. And in this document, it details the treaty making that happened after England outlawed slave trade. And of course, this year, this treaty laid the foundation for the British to assume total control over all things within Nigeria. And it was very clever the way they did this. So I do this and show you this document simply because I want to alert you to a couple of very important things. Yeah? People need to understand this. First of all, we need to understand what colonialism is. Yeah? And they define colonialism in this way. Colonialism is a system of rule which assumes the right of one people to impose their will upon another, leading inevitably to a situation of dominance and dependency which will systematically subordinate those governed by it to the imported culture in social, economic and political life. No? Now, that's assimilation, and that's how the British will rule. And so how do the British rule? How do they make this, these treaties work? One of the important things that we need to understand in this is that the moment the British signed these treaties, these treaties, by the way, were not political treaties. They were treaties of um, commerce, for trade, because the British had lost British business people who were trading in the slave trade, lost their income. And so, and because a lot of the British um, slave traders were operating around Biafra, Benin, and Nigeria, that's where they were getting their slaves from. Um, this is where the British focused their attention on, um, continue to work with that area because they already have these slave traders operating there illegally, you know, and these fellows were doing deals with, you know, tribal chiefs who didn't like one mob over there, and so they would pay these tribal chiefs certain gifts and benefits and the history shows that they say oh we don't like that mob over there so let's go and get them because they give us a lot of trouble all the time so these white fellas would go in with guns blazing and chains and put people in chains that's the, that when you that's so you can get a picture of what was going on here so they were using the British one mob was using the British against another mob yeah think about it because there are parallels here in Australia right now and so they would clear that mob, yeah? And of course, if you look at the history, if you go into the documents, if they haven't doctored the documents already, but I've read in the documents where, you know, Benelong betrayed his people, yeah? And um, he was taking white men across to the North Shore around Cremorn and Camaray, which has come from the Camaragal people, and uh, because these pe the men were resisting the white man's advances to their women and young girls, Benelong came back and told Philip to kill them. And they did. They slaughtered a lot of them. They went over there and shot them and just kept the women. Um, that's re recorded history, by the way. And um, if Australia hasn't already started doctoring those, 
documents in their foundation documents, well, then they're there for everybody to see. It just takes a little bit of reading, that's all. But let me come back to this. Yeah. And so this is what was going on. This is how people were betraying others and um, uh, for, for gain. Now, interestingly enough, the, the way, one of the interesting features of this year, when they analyzed, when these guys analyzed those treaties, they introduced it by saying this, Britain gained control of Nigeria through both diplomatic treaties, that is the treaties, and military. And at that time, Britain had those clever things that they were able to take their gunboats, yeah, ships of war, up the big rivers that were there. And so they used the gunboats against the people. And so they concluded, these guys concluded, that by 1914, Britain had gained effective control of the entire area of Nigeria as a colony. 1914. Yeah, so it's not that long ago. Treaties define the character of the British penetration in such a way that when in 1900, political control was formally established over Nigeria, Nigerian area. It took the tripartite form of three autonomous administrations. The colony and protectorate of Lagos, the protectorate of southern Nigeria, and the protectorate of Nigeria. They used the word protectorates. Yeah. And so those missions that we were put on were protectorates. They were protected areas. And they were areas set aside for Aborigines only. Yeah. And so we were became part of a protectorate. These three regions, like protectorates, became subsequently amalgamated in 1914 to form the Nigerian state. Now, as a consequence of this, Britain assumed this right to impose its will on Nigeria with the appointment of John Beecroft as the first consul of the Bites of Biafra and Benin in 1849, which marked the beginning of the British, direct British influence in Nigeria. And so this is where we need to understand what treaties can do. Yeah. And unfortunately for our people, a lot of people don't know truly what's in that Native Title Act. They really don't know. Yeah. There's a very clever thing that John Howard did. And John Howard, when he did his 10-point plan, used this British methodology. And he's asking all you fellas who sign, get native title to sign away and surrender your claims. And they also ask you, also, in terms of um, future acts, they're also in that future act clause. When you surrender area, you're giving away all your claims because they know that they did it all illegally. And they're asking you to sign it all away in those issues. And I've heard it said after Uluru, when they did that Uluru statement, that those illuas represent treaties, yeah? And so essentially what's happening now is that they're beginning to twist it so that those Iluas, while not treaties, but can be classified as a similar agreement. And this is how they're going to sneak into your country and take absolute control of everything you have. Now. When we talk about this colonialism, there is something very important that I think a lot of people will agree to and will understand here. One of the things that this document sort of talks about in terms of those trade treaties, yeah, commercial treaties, and mind you, um, when I talk about these commercial treaties, the reason I'm, I'm pointing this out is simply because the Iluas are commercial treaties. They're commercial contracts. That's, what's, that's what you're doing. Yeah? I don't know whether you know that. i got no idea whether you know that at all. Or whether any of those lawyers have a decent morale, morality 
and conscience to tell you the truth about them. If they don't, it may be that they don't know what they're doing. And that's horrible for a lawyer not to know what he's doing, but just doing it, just because it's there in legislation. But let me come back to the point that I'm making. Those illuas are commercial transactions, and they're commercial in law, they're commercial contracts. Now, but this is what they did in Nigeria. At this point, one should stress the relationship between treaties and the use of brute force. Treaties further legitimize the strength of the British gunboats. The importance of these treaties was to ones was that once signed, the British used them as the excuse to bombard Nigerian states on the grounds that one or other treaties of the Articles had been broken. However, it was rather quite difficult, if not impossible, for the local traders to keep to all the clauses of any treaty yeah, because they didn't really understand it all. Yeah? And so, the type of clauses that were in these treaties read, went like this. The chief of, da da da, agree and promise to refrain from entering into any correspondence, agreement or treaty with any foreign nation or power except with the knowledge and sanction of the Britannic Majesty's government. In other words, you couldn't talk to anyone else other than the government people. Yeah? If you did, then what you were doing was that you were breaching the agreement and they can come in and take everything off you. Yeah? And another one, clause in those treaties said, the chiefs of da 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 engage, hereby engage to assist the British consular or other officers in the execution of such duties as he may be assigned to them, and further to act upon their advice in matters relating to the administration of justice in the development of the resources of the country. The interest of commerce or any other matter in relation to peace, order and good government and the general progress of civilization. In other words, these treaties have created and made you very vulnerable to total exploitation and loss of everything you have. And this is what they say here. The various treaties, by and large, made them very vulnerable and susceptible to British revenge through military force. So in this case, they can take everything off you. Yeah? Because you signed it. One might thus be tempted to assume that the essence of the treaties were just to prepare legitimate, prepare legitimate as well as convinced moral reasons for the use of brute force and the unavoidable temptation to usurp, that is, to take up and take away all political and economic authority from the local people. Now, people, before you begin to do anything, treaties are illuous. Tell them you want to talk to someone independent of the lawyers around you. We know that land councils and native title service organisations who are running this scam of native title, we know that they say, if you don't do it now, you're going to lose the opportunity. If you don't do it now, you're not going to get any money. You're going to get this here anyway. Yeah. That's the politics of poverty, and these people play on it. These people are not your friends, they are your enemy. They are paid to take whatever you have and give it all to the crown. So be very careful. Because without you knowing, 
all these things are being made legal through legal means. And once you sign them papers, they'll use it against you. Yeah? And so the illegalities of the past, yeah, they're trying to say that the parliament has the power to do whatever they want in this case. Yeah. That may be so for white people. Yeah? Because the parliament was set up for white fellows. The parliament was not set up for black fellows. It was set up to govern white people and to regulate how white people interact and behave with each other. And then it then expanded to how they interact with people overseas and foreign countries. Yeah? And they signed treaties and they did all those things, the trade treaties and set up political treaties and political alliances to formalise their arrangements and their, their interaction. Yeah? They're not doing that with you on an equal basis. They're not doing that with you in honesty. They're not being they're, they're being very dishonest about what they want. What they want is for you to make legal all those illegalities. And you do it with the stroke of a pen. Be careful.